Turn to Colossians, the first chapter, please. Welcome to all our visitors. We're delighted to have you here tonight, and may the Lord manifest His presence in your heart and your life. Colossians, the first chapter, my message tonight, Understanding Grace. Understanding Grace. Let's read uh, verse 3, first chapter of Colossians, starting at verse 3 through verse 6. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you. Now listen to this. Since the day you heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. And knew the grace of God in truth. That's my prayer tonight, that we will better understand the grace of God in truth. Not in error, but in truth tonight. <clears throat> Take me down just a little bit on these. All right. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for the marvelous, amazing grace of our Savior. God, it's your grace that sent him to the cross. It's your grace that found us in our sin and our iniquity. It's the grace of God that brought us here tonight. It's the grace of God that keeps us. It's the grace of God so unfathomable to human minds. And yet you have given us a glimpse of it in your word. And we, we want to look at it. And we want to know your truth. Lord, the righteousness and grace of God in truth tonight. Lord, sanctify me. Give me the unction from heaven. Let me speak as the oracle of God and not of man, not of myself, but that which you have given through your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the doctrine of grace is probably the most abused and misunderstood doctrines of the church today. It's been so distorted, it's been so misinterpreted, it's often been made out as a license to sin. You can hear certain kinds of grace preaching and immediately lose all your conviction and have a lightness about you and go right on your ways without changing. And if you misuse grace, it can send you directly into a godless hell. So it's very, very important that we understand the grace of God in truth. Now, God's really been dealing with me that this is one truth that this church this pastor, this church staff, every one of us must know. We must know the teaching of the Word of God about grace. I'm going to be preaching more and more about it in the days to come, the Lord willing. But here in the first chapter of Colossians, Paul the Apostle said, We heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. These people were steadfast. The love which you have for all the saints. These were loving people. They were not slanderers. They were not gossipers. This was a loving people. And they had a hope which was laid up for them in heaven. And the Bible says that they brought forth fruit, Paul saying, and bringeth forth fruit in you since the day you heard of it. But he's, try, he's trying to tell us the reason these people were fruitful, the reason they were so steadfast, the reason why they had such a love for all the brethren is because they understood the truth, the, the grace of God in truth. That was the foundation upon which all of the fruitfulness was built. This is the foundation upon which their steadfastness came forth. It all came forth out of this knowledge that God had given to them. God had given the Colossian church through the Holy Spirit a revelation, a full revelation of the grace of God. That grace of God, once you understand it, is a life-freeing truth. It's a doctrine once you fully comprehend. It brings peace and rest and joy to your heart. And if it's misinterpreted, misunderstood, it can take you directly into hell. That's why it's so very, very important to understand it. Now, the theological definition of grace is very simple. It's the undeserved, unmerited favor and blessing of God. You don't deserve it. You didn't earn it. Out of his own tenderness, out of his own heart, God, without any deserving on our part, has shown us favor and given us mercy. Grace is the unmerited, undeserved favor and blessing of God. It takes you out of condemnation and the judgment of Almighty God through nothing more than the mercy and favor and blessing of Almighty God. 
Now, the shed blood of Jesus provided free pardon and forgiveness and exemption from all condemnation. It exempts you from all condemnation to repentance and faith in Him. Not by any works of men, not by any merit or goodness of the, of the sinner. It's the favor and the gift of God. The Scripture says, being justified freely, without cost, by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of all sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Romans 3.25, Ephesians 2.8, for, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. Now, beloved, you know as well as I do that God loves everybody on the face of the earth. There's not a murderer, there's not a rapist, there's not a dictator, there's not anyone on the face of the earth beyond the mercy and grace of God. He loves everyone. Folks, if God didn't love everyone, how would you be sitting here tonight by the grace of God? You may not have been a murderer or a rapist, you may not have been uh, any of these things, but somewhere, sometime, the grace of God came after you, found you, and delivered you, and gave you free grace. Free mercy. It wasn't because suddenly you had good feelings about God. It wasn't suddenly that you said, I want to change. No, that was the Holy Spirit working by the grace of God in you, producing conviction, drawing you to the Father. There was nothing on your part. You said, oh, no, no, one day I just got sick of sin. One day I just cried out on God. No, that was the Holy Ghost sent by the grace of God who did all the stirring and the wooing in your heart. Nothing on your part. Undeserved, unmerited grace of God. How is it that God goes down into New Orleans and goes into a sadomasochist uh, bar in the back room where they are doing these things that can't even be mentioned in public, so beyond human comprehension, and God, by His grace, goes and finds someone who has parents praying for that person, gets a hold of their heart, takes one of the leaders of that group, puts him in the ministry... Changes his life. How is it the grace of God can go down into Colombia to the uh, drug cartel and take one of those drug lords and just absolutely one moment convict him of his sins, change his life and set him free, now preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? <laughs> Many of you hearing me right now? really should have died and gone to hell by now. You should be in hell right now. If you got what you deserved. We all deserve nothing but hell. There is nothing good in us. You know, you, you take the person that says, I, I am going to turn over a new leaf. Everybody on January the 1st, the, out in the world, they turn over this new leaf. Nobody gets beyond the first week. Most of them don't get 24 hours. But suppose they could go for a year, two years, ten years, and break no laws, and, and everybody said, what a good person. Still unmerited. Favor of God has to be given to them. They can't earn it. There is no way, I don't care how long you live, you're ever going to be good enough in your own strength. There'll never be a time that you're pure enough. No way you're going to please God in anything you do in your flesh. It's totally unmerited, undeserved favor of God. Amen. I want you to go to Isaiah 61. I want to show you where the teaching of grace starts going astray and where it becomes the first beginning of its perversion. Isaiah 61. Begin to read verse 1. This is speaking, Isaiah is speaking of Christ. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. Now this is speaking of the Messiah to come. That's Jesus, our Christ. He hath sent me, this is Christ, He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. All right, look, look this way, please. Here is where the distortion of the... The preaching of grace begins. Now, 
The, the prophet says that he's, he's come to set the prisoners free, the captives to break all their chains and release them from every prison. That is the proclaimed message of grace. That's what God, Jesus is going to do. The, Isaiah said when he is born, when he comes to the earth, he's going to break every chain. He's going to set everybody free that repents. Now, suppose, pick, picture with me uh, a prisoner on death row. And he's waiting, his, he's been sent, he's waiting for the electric chair. Now, this man is a drug addict, he's an alcoholic, and he's a gambler. He, he has been judged for his sin, and he's waiting judgment. He's been condemned, and he's, he's headed for death. And one day, his attorney comes walking in, and he, he's waving a document in his hand. And on the front of that document, it says, pardon, pardoned, and it's signed by the governor of the state. And the prisoner looks at him and says, what is this? He said, for no reason, I can't understand it. I got a call from the governor yesterday and he asked me to come in his office. And he gave me this pardon for you. And he says, all that I ask of you, find out if he's repentant. Find out if he's sorry for what he's done. And if he will repent, I want you to hand it, the pardon to the warden. I want you to walk him out onto the street. And he says, this is your pardon. You are pardoned. Now, he hasn't earned it. He doesn't do anything for it. The governor, out of his grace, out of his mercy, writes him out a pardon. He has that power. And, and the man says, I, I am sorry. I, I, I really am sorry. I, I've been grieving about it ever since I've been in prison. And I am sorry. And he gets on his knees and he said, oh, God, forgive me. And tell the governor I am, I am absolutely sorry. And the attorney goes to the warden. The warden walks him out in the street. And here's the man, he's pardoned, and he's a free man to go where he wants to go and do what he pleases, he's free. He can no longer be judged for his past sins. They can't take him back to court because he's been pardoned for that, all his past iniquity. All right, he takes him out in the street and, and the attorney says, now you are free. But is he free? This man is still a prisoner. This man is still bound by alcohol. This man has no willpower of his own. He has no strength. He's a weak man. Within 10 minutes, he's walking down the street and he can't walk past the first bar. And he goes in and he gets drunk. He comes out drunk, but he's also a drug addict. And down the street, he meets an old uh, friend of his who's a pusher. And the man says, hey, look, I have no money, but but you know me. I, I'm good for it. And he gives him a bag of heroin. And he snorts it up his nose. And he gets stoned. This man can't go past the the lottery store. And he's in there and he's bumming a dollar off of somebody because he just had to put a dollar bet on something. And this man is absolutely in prison. He's not free. Now, try telling that man, once pardoned, always pardoned. Once free, always free. You can never again be judged. You can never again be condemned for anything you do. You're a free man. Now, he knows better. He knows that if he breaks the law, if he murders somebody, he's back under judgment. He's, he knows that. And here's where the preaching of grace goes astray. The concept is that you come to Jesus one time, and you come under the grace and mercy of God, you are forever free, no matter what you do. Now, it's not preached that way. It's not, it's not said that in any clear terms. But the effect of it, this is what is heard, this is what is practiced by multitudes of Christians. Now, Jesus came according to Isaiah to set the captives free. What good is it telling a man, you are eternally free? In other words, you're out of prison now and God is going to save you. In eternity, you have eternal life. What good is it telling a man he's got eternal life if he doesn't have power to live it here? He can't live down here on earth. He has no power. He has no strength. Folks, the grace of God not only pardons you, it not only forgives you, the grace of God provides the power over sin. I see a church today filled with Christians who are forgiven. They've been pardoned, they've been released, they're out on the street. 
But they're still bound. They're still bound by old lusts. They're bound by habits. They're bound by their old desires. They keep going back to the world. They're bound. They are not free. The whole church all over the United States and around the world. Sometimes, I, I believe there are some churches that have as many bound people inside as there are outside. They've never been free in their spirit. They've never been free in their hearts. Whom the Lord, whom the Son sets free, is free indeed. Not just pardoned, not just forgiven, but he's free. Grace is unmerited favor, it's unmerited forgiveness, but it's also unmerited power over sin. For sin shall not have dominion over you, the scripture says. It shall not have power over you. Now, here's the really good news about grace. The grace that is in Christ Jesus not only forgives, but it keeps you. The same power of grace that saved you is the same power of grace that keeps you. Hallelujah. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. You know what that means in Greek? It simply means when sin rises up in strength and power, grace rises up with even greater strength and power within you. Where sin is abounding, it's coming at you, releasing more power, exerting more strength, trying to pull you back down. That's when the grace of God comes in and comes with greater strength than you've ever known, greater power. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Now, why does God give us grace? Why does he forgive us and free us? Just so we can go out in the street and say, I'm free, we're out of prison, and you, you say, I'm free, I can do what I please? God gave us undeserved favor. He gave us undeserved grace to bring us not only out of prison, but to bring us to himself, back to himself. The scripture says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Why? That he might bring us back to God. That is what grace is doing. Grace is in the world calling. Come back. Come back. Come back. Grace is all over these streets saying, Come back. Every backslider. Everyone's ever heard the gospel. Everyone's ever known Jesus. Grace is calling. Come back. Come back. It's the drawing power of God through the Holy Spirit. Not only to bring us back to God, but to keep us from going back into captivity. Now let me tell you what could be the greatest encouragement to your faith. If you really want to rejoice in the grace of God. It's very, very simple. But this is how it works in me. And, and it's, it's so simple that you have to listen to get a hold of it. You've got to be very sure in your heart that God did not pay such a high price, the blood of his own son, simply to forgive you and that you enjoy a temporary release from the clutches of the devil. You can be sure God didn't go through all of this. He didn't suffer the pain. He did not give his own son. His blood was not shed simply to give you forgiveness for a season where you go out and you are free for the first 30 days of your salvation or the first year you enjoy it and then you go back into the clutches of the devil. Folks, put on your thinking cap. The price that Jesus paid was all sufficient not only to save you from the power of sin initially but to keep you all your lifetime from the power of sin. All your lifetime. You can know that God made provision if he made provision to save you, he made provision to keep you. The provision is there. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. But you say to me, but Pastor Dave, grace failed me. Because it, it didn't keep me from falling. It didn't hold me back. It didn't restrain me because suddenly I got a desire for the world and I went back. I got drunk, or I got high. I, I went out and did something I thought I'd never do again because God had delivered me, and I took a fall. Grace did not keep me. You say this keeping power, grace didn't keep me. I, I failed God. I'm, I've sinned against the Lord. And some of you here tonight have to acknowledge that right now, Brother Dave, that's where I am. But you say, grace failed me? No. Let me ask you a question. When, when you took that fall, when you sinned, was there grief in your heart? 
Did you suddenly say, oh God, I'm so sorry, why did I do that? Was there something in your heart said, oh God, I've sinned against you? God, I don't know what happened. I didn't want this, and it came. Do you feel convicted? Do you feel that you have wounded the Savior? Who is that? That's not coming from you. You're not capable of that. All you're capable of in your flesh is once you go down, is to once you take a fall, you stay down and you just go deeper and deeper into sin. Why are you grieving? Why is there conviction? That's grace at work. That's grace still holding on. Hallelujah. You can rejoice in that right now. Say, well, brother, that's me. I feel the grief. I know I've, I've wounded the Lord. And, and though I failed God, I want to come back to his mercy. I, I want his forgiveness and I want his love. But the devil going to tell you, no, you failed. You're not going to make it. You're dirty. You're unclean. You're used goods now. You're discarded. Run. The grace says, no. Come back. Come back. God's made provision for this. Godly sorrow works repentance. But where does that godly soul come from? Not some secret well in you. Some no, some fleshly spiritual thing in you that suddenly rises up. No, there's no good in you even when you fall. There's no good at all. That's the grace of God. The Holy Spirit who won't let go. He's the hound of heaven. He hounds you and he'll make you so miserable only to get you back. Nobody's as miserable as somebody who's running from God. What a misery that is. But that's a whole, I call it Holy Ghost miseries. Wonderful misery that brings us back to his love. Hallelujah. Now, you who struggle against the besetting sin, and you battle a raging lust, the scripture says his grace is sufficient. His grace is absolutely sufficient. God says, look, I loved you. When you were an alien, I loved you when you were a sinner, when you were against me, when you had no time for me, when you were dead in your trespasses and sins. I died for you then. I loved you then. Do you think for a moment because you took a fall, he's going to leave you and stop loving you, stop wooing you? Not at all. He said, remember, I loved you when you didn't even know me, when you were out of order, when you were dead in your sins. I loved you. I was motivated in love for you then. I'm motivated in love for you now. Hallelujah. Now let me tell you how to pray when you have come up against an abounding sin and it's overwhelmed you. The Bible talks about those who have fallen into trans, uh, to trespasses. And the word trespasses there means a fall into sin. Those who have trespassed the Lord and it's abounding sin. Here's how to pray. Dear Lord, I have no power or strength to combat my flesh. I can't seem to help myself. I feel like I'm still enslaved. But Lord, I hate my sin. I know you saved me because you loved me. And I know you still love me. Lord, let me see your strength perfected in my weakness. Loosen the grip of sin on me. Keep me in godly sorrow. Lord, I don't want to trust my flesh. My promises are worthless. My willpower is no power. My tears have no merit. Lord, infuse me with your life-giving nourishment. Pour into me the power of the Holy Ghost. Jesus, let me cling to you. Let me trust you to do whatever is necessary to help me understand your love. Bring me back to deliverance. It's the clinging to Jesus. It's the coming back to him that causes the grace of God to be infused into your life. Now, there's a perverted teaching of grace The apostle said that ends up in lasciviousness. Now, the word lasciviousness means filthiness, debauchery. And it can lead you into the worst kind of sin, wickedness. I'm reading, don't turn to Jude to verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares, crept into the church, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, I once overheard a Pentecostal preacher. I was walking in front of him. He was talking to a man behind me. And I overheard him and said, Look, and I don't know if he meant me to hear this or not, because he just heard me recently before that preach a message on holiness and obedience. He said, and I quote almost verbatim, Obedience has nothing to do with our salvation. 
Obedience implies works of flesh. And we're saved by grace only. He said obedience has nothing to do with our salvation. My Bible says, follow peace and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. No man shall see the Lord without holiness. Now, I don't know a single pastor or an evangelist on the face of the earth who would acknowledge that they were one of these men named or identified by by Jude as being ungodly seducers and those who would pervert the gospel of grace. They would, they would deny that. Say, so, oh yes, I, I, I preach grace and I preach grace a lot, but, but I am not one of those kind. But let me tell you something. There are multitudes of men today, teachers and evangelists and pastors, standing in pulpits, frustrating the grace of God and preaching a false grace. Now, listen to me, please. You can go out on these streets, like I have done on a number of occasions, and you can picture a man, for example, He's staggering out of an X-rated uh, theater with a with a lady, and you're there witnessing on the street. You go up to this man, and you have your Bible, and you you begin a conversation, and he he tells you he's from a, a southern state, and he's up here in New York City on business. But he says, it, it, it kind of wink, he said, "Don't tell my wife." In other words, this is not my wife. And the man is reeking, he's with with alcohol, and he's come out of an X-rated Joe, and he, he said, I see you have your Bible. He said, and you tell him, yes, I'm here to tell you that Jesus loves you. He can save you. He said, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm saved. I am truly saved. I love the Lord. I know his mercy. Every night before I go to bed, I thank him for his mercy. I was saved 10 years ago. And by the way, I'm a deacon in the church. But I want you to know I've got my weaknesses. I've got my problems. But I am saved. And you can't convict, convict, you can't convince him of anything. I'm saved. Now, of course, somebody will, will come along and a, after the man dies a wicked, sinful death, and they say, well, he never read, he was saved in the first place. Who makes you judge of that? Who makes any man judge of that? I am saved. You know, I, 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 I the whole nation is filled with people. Like, the man who came to me in Union Square when we had a street rally a number of years ago. And I had just finished preaching. I come off the, the stage area and this man is drunk. And he was a former, he was a pastor. I don't know what church. He said, praise the Lord, Brother David. He just about blew me away. <laughs> he said, boy, that's good preaching. He, he said, I love preaching like that. And he said, I'm a, I'm a minister also. And he said, I really love the Lord. And the man was so drunk. And the man's evidently just walking the streets. And this man's convinced. And there was nothing I could say to him. I said, you know, you tell him, man, you're drunk. You're an alcoholic. But the mercy of God. God is so merciful. It's grace. I, I, I got a call from a number of years ago from a, <clears throat> the... the leader of a minister's group in a southern city. He said, Brother Dave, and he, he was heartbroken. He said, could you come to our city and just meet with the pastors? Now, I didn't feel led to go because I go only where the Holy Spirit tells me. But he said, I have, you've got to come, Brother Dave. He said, we've just discovered, we've, we've, we've just discovered, in fact, it's been in the paper, uh, a homosexual minister in the city, <clears throat> It was in the papers for molesting someone, a younger child. He said, now we've discovered there are 15 pastors who are youth pastors and music directors and churches in this city. Fifteen of them meet regularly. They're all homosexuals. And they're all teaching our kids. And they're all teaching that it's all right. Now, folks, I'm going to ask you a question. Where does this come from? Where do people get the concept? Where do they get this idea that I can sin as I please? But there was a time back there I asked Jesus to come into my heart, and and I believed in the grace of God, and that covers me. That covers me. I can... The Lord has mercy. Every night I go home, I get down on my knees, and I pray, Lord, I thank you for your mercy. Forgive me. And it's every night, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but there's no meaning of it. There's no true repentance. 
The grace of God is offered to those who have true repentance. There has to be a repentance, a turning away from our iniquities. And I'll prove that to you in just a moment. There are multitudes going to wake up in hell, gritting their teeth and shaking their fist at those who told them, putting a false security in their hearts that they could, no matter what they did, no matter how they sinned against God, no matter how addicted they were, no matter how they flaunted themselves in this world, that they were saved, that the grace of God was extended, and that was it. Covers all their sins. I want you to turn to Titus, and I want to show you how wrong this is. Second chapter of Titus. Titus 2. I'm going to give you two verses that you ought to underline and mark in your Bible. If you have a King James, I want you to read with me verses 11 and 12. Are you ready? Titus 2. I'll wait for you. Some of you haven't gotten there yet. If you're having trouble finding it, if you go to Philemon and turn left. (laughs) Hebrews, turn left. Titus, the second chapter, read with me, verse 11 and 12. Beginning, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. I want you to read it again with me. Start in verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. I'm going to read to you from the prophet Isaiah, who prophesied the same thing years and years before. Don't turn there, it's Isaiah 61.3. The Lord hath anointed me, speaking of Christ, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Look, grace pardons. Grace delivers from all captivity. Grace empowers us over sin. Then grace teaches us how to deny ungodliness and how to live a holy life. Now, folks, that is where the perversion is. There's not the emphasis, not the follow-up on this holy living. The grace of God is given to teach us to deny ungodliness through the conviction of the Holy Spirit and to live godly, righteous lives in this present world. In this present world. Isaiah said the Christ, when he comes, he's going to give you beauty for ashes. He'll turn your sorrow into joy. He'll take off the rags of heaviness and he'll clothe you with a garment of praise. But he said there's a reason for it. I'll do that for a purpose. And folks, this is the good news of grace. There is good news in grace. It is a good news message. But the message is this. God intends to teach us how to be planted and rooted in righteousness as trees. As oak trees planted by living waters. He wants to plant us and root us, teaching us how to walk in holiness... But he's, he, listen to me, grace provides an atmosphere in which you can grow without fear. That's the whole purpose of grace. God says, I'm going to, you're mourning, I'm going to give you a, a joy. Your ashes, I'm going to give you beauty. I'm going to create an atmosphere where you can trust me that I have, I'm all sufficient for all your problems. I have all sufficient forgiveness for every sin. If you confess and forsake your sin, you say forsake your sin. Yes, he promised to give you power to forsake your sins. 
And here's the marvelous uh, uh, beauty of grace. If you don't hear anything else, get this, please. God never intended that serving him and walking in holiness would be a dreaded thing. That we walk around with a long face and say, this is such a hard battle, man. This is awful trying to serve God. Man, I, I, it, just, it just tears my, my soul. I, I, I don't know how I'm ever going to make it going around dragging all the time. Trying to be holy, trying to grit your teeth, trying to tough it out. And it's a dreaded, horrible, like you're walking around with a ball and chain on your feet. God never intended it that way. He intended that you could learn to walk in holiness, denying ungodliness, in a spirit of security, in joy and beauty, with a garment of praise. He has given us that atmosphere. If you really believe that Jesus loves you, if you really believe in all your heart that He can keep you, now I believe there's power to keep you eternally. I don't believe you have to get up and down hot and cold. You don't have to be in and out. I believe God can establish you. I believe in the eternal security of the eternal believer. It's an atmosphere. Folks, that's why God had brought such joy to this church. He's trying to... He's, he is here. Grace is here in this atmosphere. He's not going to teach you how to walk in holiness in an atmosphere of fear. He wants to break the spirit of fear completely. That we w- that He would grant you, grant to us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve Him without fear in holiness and righteousness all the days of our lives. Folks, that's one of the most encouraging scriptures in the Bible. That all your lifetime you can live without, you can walk in holiness before the Lord without fear. You, you can walk in holiness without fear of falling. Oh, the grace of God has secured us. Would you please get it out of your mind that God's mad at you? I, I, I wasn't going to do this, but I, I'm, I'm going to repeat it tonight. Some of you heard me tell about it. How God delivered me from my fear. I used to dread the holiness of God. I used to dread. I, I, I had been to a home where I, I was holding a meeting and where a man driving out of his driveway backed up over his little child and killed her. And I was at the funeral. And they were sitting on two chairs by the casket. And I looked at that little... I think she was about a year and a half or two, dead child. And I got kind of angry at God. And I took the pastor aside and I said, what did you do? What kind of sin did you do that God had to do this to you? He just walked away. He was worst thing I ever did to a man. He was down already. I should have encouraged him, but I, I couldn't figure it out. I was angry. I drove home and and... Debbie and Bonnie were in the driveway, and I wouldn't even, I got frightened of driveways. Then went go in my driveways. And I went in, I, I walked right past my family. First, I gathered the girls in my arm, and I said, God, you don't ever take one of mine. I'll never let you down. You don't have to take one of mine. I won't let you down. You see, I'm going to strive. I'm going to do it. You, I, I will never hurt you, Lord, that you have to hurt me back, is what the theology of my thinking at the time. And I'll tell you, <clears throat> I'd only been to New York City, I think, uh, two or three times. But this time, I told my wife, I said, I'm sorry, i just gotten back. I said, I've got to get back to the streets of New York. I, I, I told her what happened. And I went back to New York City from the country, and I had my hands gripping on the wheel. My joy was gone. And I'm saying, God, I'll work my fingers to the bone, but don't ever kill one of my babies. That's the thinking. I didn't say it that way, but that's what I'm thinking. And I came to these streets, and I walked these streets, and I worked, and I slept in my car. I gave away my shoes, walked in my red socks, I'd give anything because I wanted to please God. And folks, 
I labored the next three months without any joy at all. It was all gone. And I labored under burden. I went down to 115 pounds. I weigh 164 right now, so take almost 50 pounds off this body. When I drank lemonade, they thought I was a thermometer, someone said. (laughs) I came home weak, and my children, I had neglected them completely. See, I've got to make it up to God somehow. Folks, there's a lot of us like that. we just always striving to please God. Lord, I failed you, but I'll make it up. I'll make it up. Folks, the Bible says if you're going to try to establish your own righteousness, Christ died in vain for you. You have frustrated the grace of God. The grace of God is of no value to you, then the Bible says. Christ died in vain because you're trying to do it yourself. See, that's not what grace is all about. Jesus already did it, and he finished it. All I have to do is draw from that power. He has all the power, all the energy, everything, because it's all sufficient for all things. That's what grace is. Folks, if you don't understand grace at all, I'll give you one definition, and I want you to listen to it. Grace is all sufficiency for all things in Christ. That's what grace is, all sufficiency for all things in Christ, if you believe it, if you appropriate it. And I wasn't appropriating it. I came home one day, went into my little study, my prayer room. I had a a, a green blanket. I threw myself down and said, God, I can't go on anymore. I can't go on anymore. I'm at the end of my rope. And the Lord said, go into the bedroom where Bonnie and Debbie is. And the Holy Spirit led me to go in. Holy Spirit said, pick up Debbie. Debbie was on the top bunk. And I picked her up. And though she was asleep, she had missed me so much, she just held on like a wire. And I walked out in the living room just loving her. And and, uh, a voice came to me in the living room. Drop her on the floor. Drop her? I must be losing my mind. The Lord said, drop her. You said, God didn't say that. Yes, he did. And I held her all the time. I said, no, she's my girl. Why would I drop her? And the Lord said, you're my son. Why would I drop you? Why would I drop you? Does she run every time she sees you? No, she runs to me. W- would you do anything for that girl but bless her and love her? I said, no. God said, you've got it all wrong. And God said, David... I'm not mad at you. I've never been mad at you. That's enough. And I tell you what, the joy of the Lord filled my heart. I laid her down and I danced all over the house like a sailor just been at sea for years. And I've not been mad at him since. The grace of God has flooded my heart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, I came back to New York City, but I came with joy. I came with victory in my soul. Hallelujah. And by the way, my daughters are grown, and they made it through all my driveways. And the Lord's never, folks, the Lord is not a killer. Get that out of your mind. The Lord is not a murderer. He's not a killer. He's here to save and to heal. Hallelujah. That through death he... Christ might destroy him that had power over death, power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now, folks, I've got to tell you something. This this matter of grace, this matter of walking in holiness before the Lord, the power of grace to to break the bonds of sin and to, to give us power to deny ungodliness, The Lord did not make a unilateral decision about holiness only for his own good. In other words, you've got to live holy, you've got to live righteous because it pleases me. 
God's greater concern, listen to me now, I believe this is all my heart, His greater concern is, I have commanded you to walk in holiness and righteousness because I know what it produces. I know what it'll do in your life. I know the joy. I know the peace. I know if you don't, you'll hide from me. I know if you don't walk in holiness and righteousness, you will live in despair and bondage. God demands of us holiness and righteousness for our own welfare. Hallelujah! So that we're not walking around fearing the devil at all times. We're walking in freedom, absolute freedom and joy in the Holy Ghost. Because that is the byproduct of walking in righteousness and holiness before the Lord. Hallelujah. Now there's one last aspect of grace that's all important. And it's this matter of frustrating the grace of God. Paul, writing to Corinthians, said, We beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, Paul said, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. And that means of no value or worth nothing. He said, But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Now Paul was saying, There is such abundant grace in Jesus to satisfy every need. Grace can supply you the strength He said, uh, I'm just a frail man, but God gave me grace so that I labored more than all of the youngers around me. All of the young people he's talking about. All of those who walked with me. All of those who traveled with me. And he's thinking of all the other disciples. He said, I labored more abundantly than all. He's speaking of the other apostles. I labored more abundantly because of the grace of God that was given to me. Folks, in your weakness, he has all the grace that you need. When you have failed him, he has all the pardon and the forgiveness that you need. The scripture makes this clear. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you also, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Paul said, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Now I'm going to close in just a moment. But here's our problem. And here's how we frustrate the grace of God. And here's how we make the cross of Jesus Christ of no effect. And Paul, in fact, said, if you go this way, you've fallen from grace. The grace is not at work in your life. And what he's really saying, we think that we please God by our superhuman efforts to avoid temptation. We try always to do better in our own strength. We're working so hard to please Him by going around doing good. We keep striving. We go around constantly, every little thing saying, I'm sorry, Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me, forgive me, I'm sorry. We never do come into the rest. We try, when we fail God or we're facing temptation, we say, I'm going to tough this out. I'm going to beat this. No, you won't. You're not going to beat it in your own strength. Your promises mean nothing to God. Paul said, I have no confidence in the flesh. No confidence. I don't know any man after the flesh. Don't tell me who you are in the flesh. Tell me who you are in Christ. Tell me how you're drawing the provision. Tell me how you're being nourished by that which is in the head, Jesus Christ. And folks, you've got to understand this is the only way you can understand grace. That in Jesus, God has given everything I need for godliness and holiness. All I need for strength, for healing. He is all in all. He is all sufficient. God gave Jesus as his gift of grace. Jesus is the grace. He was given to us to draw out of him everything that we need. That's why we're told to cling to him. To draw nigh to Him. To become intimate with Him. That we draw on His strength. You say, well, how do you do that? Folks, there's no formula. That's His part. You stay close to Jesus. My my finger doesn't have to figure out. My hand doesn't have to stop and think, well, how does the life come through? It comes from the head. It comes from the heart. It's being pumped. It just abides there. Folks, we just abide in Jesus by faith. It's His part to bring life and strength into us. When... You, you, you'll be sitting in a meeting like this and thinking, I, I'm just about, I can't go another step. And suddenly, life comes to you. Where did it come from? The grace of God flowing into you. You can be discouraged on the job saying, I'm going to quit this job. I can't go another day. I can't handle this. 
and suddenly sitting there in the grace of God comes on you and that everything has changed. Why? Because you say, Jesus, come. Jesus, you call on that strength. You call on that grace. Hallelujah. Because he said it's all sufficient for all things. Now, folks, I don't know if you can figure this out or not. I'm trying to boil it down to the simplest way so that any one of our converts can understand it. The grace of God comes to you. You don't deserve a thing. And Jesus has been given to you as your Lord and Savior, but also as the source of all the power, all the strength that you'll ever need. If you failed Him, He has all the forgiveness that you ever need. And I'll tell you what, he make you stronger. If a steel beam breaks, it's brought together and it's welded. And I'm told it's stronger at that weld than it is every, anywhere else on that beam. God can make you stronger. Because sometimes when you fall, he knocks all the pride out of you. All the confidence in the flesh. And he said, I told you that. It doesn't, but, but, but Paul said, you mean you're thinking of sinning just to prove God's grace, the grace may about? He said, God forbid. That's not the way you think. But he said, if a man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So get back up again in faith and say, in Jesus' name, my Christ is all sufficient for everything that I need. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Stand with me, please. Amazing. He came to empower us to live a fruitful life here for Him and to finish His work. That's the key to understanding the grace of God in truth. Not just forgiven, but empowered and taught how to live holy and to finish His purpose, eternal purpose here on earth. Hallelujah. Now, here's the altar call. Up in the balcony here in the main floor, and listen to me, please. I'm, I'm obeying the Holy Spirit now, just as He leads me. I feel the Holy Spirit saying to me that there's some people here tonight really discouraged. You're discouraged because you have been trying so hard to please the Lord. You've been trying so hard to fight temptation. You're fighting it, though, in your own power. And if you fight it in your own strength, you're not going to be successful. You'll fall. But you need to come to Jesus tonight and say, Lord, I turn my struggle over to you. I fought it enough myself. I'm coming to you. I'm clinging to you. Lord, I'm calling on you to give me the hatred for sin. And you infuse your power, the power of the Holy Ghost. If we, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the flesh, we shall live. If through the Spirit, through the Spirit, we kill, we mortify sin. Wherever you're at, the Lord wants to take that discouragement away. And he wants to produce in you a, a sense of security and say, I, Brother Dave, I know he saved me. I know he's with me. He's going to secure me. And he's going to give me peace and forgiveness so that I can learn. Folks, we're in school. Just because you, you flunk one class, you don't get expelled. You're in a school. Amen. What happens? You study harder. You dig in. Some of you have fallen. You dig in now. You dig in and say, God, you're going to bring me through. You're going to make me stronger at this point. Now, if you're here tonight up in the balcony, go to either stairs on either side. Come down any aisle. And here in the main floor. Now, if you're backslidden in your heart, you say, Brother Dave, I have failed God. Or there's something in your life that stands between you and intimacy with Jesus. I want you to get out of your seat and come and stand here right now and say, Lord, I want deliverance tonight. I want to be free. And, and most of all, I want to get out of this discouragement, the spirit of discouragement that's upon me. I know that I, I have sensed it tonight that a number of you have that spirit. It's a spirit of discouragement. And the Lord wants to totally encourage you, cleanse you, forgive you, and let you walk out of here encouraged in Him. Amen. Jesus, for this grace, just say it. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you for your mercy to me. Now, let's pray this from in the innermost part of our being. Pray it from way down deep in your spirit. Lord Jesus, 
I found your love. And I know that you love me. And I know, Lord, that I can come to you and accept my pardon. You did it on the cross. It's finished. I am pardoned because I've repented. My repentance does not merit salvation. But, oh, Jesus, I come now to lay hold of what you've promised. Pardon through the blood. Forgiveness through the blood. Redemption through the blood. Peace with God through the blood. Acceptance with the Father through the blood. It's all through the blood. All through the cross of Jesus. Forgive me. And now, Jesus, I will say to you now and to the whole world, I believe Jesus saves. He saves me. He saves me now. He saves me tonight. And He empowers me by the Holy Spirit to have power over sin. By grace, I am saved and I am free and I have your power. This is the conclusion of the message.